Father, we pray that your words come to us today and call forth from us more life. Your words are life and draw us forward. And if you could move us one step, if you could move me one step forward today, God, that would be enough. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been talking about the fruits of the Spirit. When the Spirit of God is moving and we're connected to the Spirit of God and God's moving inside of us, one of the things that happens, one of the things that is gonna grow in us is peace. Because the fruit of the Spirit is, among other things, it is peace. Because the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And what that means is it's kind of this internal settledness. It is a calm that is inside of us. And it means that there's a wholeness and completeness in our life. And it's not that we don't have conflict and struggles and pain in our life, but it's that things are the way that they're supposed to be. Even if there's still conflict in your life, there is still kind of this wholeness, whether it's in your marriage, in your family, in, in a church, in a community, in a city, in a nation, 
Shalom is the way that things are supposed to be, where marriages are strong and children feel safe in the family. But the problem is sometimes, quite often, something destroys the peace. It destroys the shalom, whether in our marriages, in our families, in a church, in a community, in a city, in, in a nation, in, in the world. Something disturbs the peace. Something has destroyed and spoiled the fruit. So the question that we started to talk about last week was, what are the things that historically and typically presently maybe destroy this sense of peace, this sense of shalom? What are the things that destroy peace inside of a marriage and in a church and in nations? And last week we talked about the first of the two things, the first being our own junk, our own sin, just before Paul started talking about the fruit of the Spirit, because he was really excited to talk about the different fruits of the Spirit, he talks about there are other things that could also be growing in you. There are other things that, that can break this connection that you have with God. When you're starting to live out of your own desires, out of your own ambitions, when you're wanting to do life your way, among other things, he says in Galatians, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of anger, or rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. These are things like these, they disturb the peace that God is wanting to grow inside of every one of us. They destroy marriages, these things, they destroy families and churches and communities. These things on the list here, they destroy nations because love and joy and peace, the things that, that the Spirit of God is wanting to do and grow inside of us, they can't grow if they're in an environment where these other things are thriving and growing Immorality and envy, fits of rage, anger, selfish ambition, it can't grow in that kind of an environment because they're not just opposed to shalom and peace, they actually destroy in those kind of environments shalom and peace, they spoil the fruit. And the invitation that we had last week was to turn from those things, to repent of those things to walk away from the things that are destroying the peace that we want. And by walking in the Spirit, meaning connected to God intimately, we can begin to develop peace in our life. And, we can, and you, can rebuild, you can rebuild damage in your family and in your marriage and in relationships. If it has been damaged or destroyed, it can be rebuilt. Marriages can be healed. Health can come into those situations, but that is going to be another talk about the process of healing. But it doesn't just happen once by this turning. It's an again and again and again situation where daily, sometimes hourly, for some of us it might even be up to the minute, where we turn back to God as our source of life every day for the rest of our lives because that is a part of living in the kingdom of God where we would become the kind of people who understand that coming to God is a lifelong process. It's not a, I did it once and now I'm done. I came to God when I was 13 and I'm good. I'm a Christian and I live my life. But it is this lifelong process where we are turning from darkness to light, a process lifelong of turning from the things that are false to the truth, from turning from things that destroy shalom to peace in your life, your entire life long. And what you get is life in the kingdom of God. And the message of the kingdom is not that you just need to accept Jesus in your heart as your Savior so you can go to heaven when you die, though that is a really good thing to do. And for many, and for me, when I was a young kid, that was my motivation for why I became a Christian, because I didn't want to go to hell because I heard that was bad. I wanted to go to heaven because that seemed good. And that was not a, a wrong motive to accept Jesus as my Savior and my teacher. But as I got older, I realized he's also the one I want to learn to put my confidence in, that he really does know the best about my life and how I can walk. And as you turn from your own desire to serving God, in that turning, you start to enter into the reality 
you begin to experience life in the kingdom of God that is designed to also be right here, right now, because you start to taste and experience love and joy and peace. And those, those are the things that are what we would call the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the fruit of turning. That when I, when I, when I turn to God and say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow you in this moment because I really, I really want to go this way. <laughs> just really want to be angry or I want to say things that are angry but I just go I'm going to bite my tongue God fill me right now I really need it and I'm going to choose to love and it's really hard but God I know that's what you're asking me to do in this moment and I choose that I'm choosing the kingdom that is the fruit of turning and how God and I start to connect deeper so the number one disturber of the kind of peace that I'm really after in my own life is, is my own sin. But there's a second thing that, that disturbs that peace. There are circumstances that come into our lives that we have no control of, and it's, it's not connected to anything that we've done. It's not always even a causal effect where sometimes we just have, and every one of us have this, where things just blow into our life like a storm, and when it comes, it destroys peace, it destroys shalom. When I was in college, I was living in California and I was studying art and uh, specifically I was, I was doing a lot of uh, pottery and sculpture and I'd been working uh, trying to learn some glass sculpture and I was in bed and it's about 7.30 in the, the morning and I was woken up by an earthquake. The whole, my whole uh, apartment started to just shake and, and I really knew it was bad when all my pottery and glass sculptures started to fall, fall from the shelves onto the floor, and they just shattered, and I lost half of my heart that day because uh, my homework was also in that pile of glass, and it was due later that day, and the pottery was shattered, and I'm like, oh, all these wonderful things I made, and, and what do you do when those things happen other than roll back over and go back to sleep? Um, cause it's not, it's going to be there later. I might as well get some more rest. <laughs> I hate when things like that happen though. Having four kids in, in my family means someone is always sick. And if you are a friend of my family, then, and you talk to my wife, it's just a really good chance if you could say who's sick, she will have an answer. It's like an open door to a conversation. So who's sick in your family this week? Because it's gonna be a reality, it's 99% of the time, or if they're not sick, they have somehow passed it on to me and my wife, and we are sick, and when someone's sick, it upsets the balance of our entire family because now it upsets driving and schedules and who can do what sports, who's not, how do we start to, it drives our family into chaos. And I hate it because it adds stress to our family. And when flu, uh, COVID flew through our family, well, then you start to add more of that fear and worry element of where is this going to lead and how is this going to uh, play out in our, our family, and it starts to create a stress, and we start to panic, and we want to figure out how do we manage life and weigh the possible solutions and outcomes and what it is that we need to be doing. When things like this blow into our lives, whether it's an earthquake, though that's not really something that happens here, or sickness, or family members getting sick, it disturbs the peace, and that raises the question, is it possible to experience Shalom, uh, this wholeness, a completeness and peace when you're in the middle of a storm that it's not even from anything that you had control of. It's just an event that is outside of our lives. To be at peace in the middle of the storm like Jesus was in Mark chapter 4, and, and some of you, many of you might know the story where Jesus and his disciples, they'd been really busy, and they'd been doing a lot of ministry. They had been, uh, he'd been preaching and, and, and teaching and healing people and all these relationships and people coming in and wanting time with them, and, and everyone's just kind of after the attention, and the disciples are helping and trying to act like little bodyguards and shuffling people around and moving the, and trying to help out and answering things that they might know and trying to share the, the heart of the kingdom of God, and it was just exhausting for them because it had been happening over this long stretch of time, and, 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 and so they needed to kind of get away and just kind of decompress a little, get some perspective, get some refreshment. And so they, 
Uh, they get into this boat, Jesus and his disciples, to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee to get some time to just kind of get a deep breath. And they were kind of relaxing in the boat as they were crossing when the storm came on. And, and in the middle of the storm, Jesus is asleep, but the storm, I mean, the boat's going crazy, and the disciples, who are gifted sailors, they're starting to panic. So you know that's a bad thing when sailors panic. They were starting to be very concerned for their safety. And and then there's Jesus, who's just asleep, and I don't know how. That doesn't make any sense to me, but he is completely at peace to be able to rest. And that's kind of a metaphor. It's a, it's, a, it's a metaphor of what it looks like when we find ourselves in this weird place, this weird, maybe even season, for reasonable people, who, who, for those of us who get terrified when the storms of life hit us, but Jesus is asleep in the middle of the storm. So when Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit, and he's talking to us about the fruit of the Spirit being peace, my, my question is, does that include times when we're in the middle of the storm? Is that, what kind of peace do we get, and is it okay if I'm not at peace when we're in the middle of a storm? Philippians chapter 4, 7, Paul, he starts talking about peace that goes beyond understanding. There, there are some types of peace that I understand. Um, there's a kind of peace, though, that passes my ability to understand. And, and a few verses later, he says, I've learned the secret to contentment. And the word content is just basically a different word for shalom. Storm, no storm, Paul says. I've learned the secret here. Uh, I've learned how to be content, really. And I need you to believe me. I, I, I really have. And when someone says this to me, I don't know that I believe it. Because it's easy for people to say that, that they found the secret. But here it says in verse 11, it says, For I have learned to be content, meaning at peace here, inside me, regardless of whatever is going on out here, outside of me. Whatever circumstance I'm in, storm, no storm, so that I can experience peace and shalom in my heart. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and, and every situation, whether being well-fed or, or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. I can do the storm and be at peace in my heart, or I can do prosperity and I can still be calm because it's Christ who gives me the ability to walk in either of them, to walk both. And honestly, sometimes... I think ha, uh, prosperity can even be the harder journey than the storm. And then I go, okay, which do you think Paul? And I look at, where did I put Paul? Paul's over there. I go, Paul, which one is harder, prosperity or suffering? Uh, which, one, which one, going hungry or, or having all your needs met? And I think Paul would say that he likes having food. I think he would agree with that. It's nice to have food. It's nice to walk in prosperity more. Going hungry and suffering doesn't have the power to destroy you or me in the peace that I have, though, and shalom that God gives me. Because Paul says, I've learned the secret. Either way, I can do that. And I'm like, well, that's kind of a big claim. That's a really big statement that you are making. And I go, who could say that? And the reason I, 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 I think it's important is because anyone could kind of do, you know, say this thing. Anyone can make this bold statement. Because if I'm in the storm in my life and someone tries to give me advice and they've never actually been in that storm, the things that they might say, it might actually be true. They might say good things to me, but if you've never been in that storm, I'm not going to listen to you. I don't actually care about your advice. I've already shut you off, shut you down, blocked my heart. I don't care about your great wisdom if you don't actually have experience in that. I want to know someone who's been through the storm and knows how to actually get peace in the middle of that storm, who has lived it, not just with some great bumper sticker motto to tell me how it is that I can have peace in the middle of the storm. If you have gone through it, then I will listen to you. My wife and I, we went through 10 years of infertility. That was a very painful process for my wife and I. We didn't understand it. We had gone to a lot of doctors. Every doctor gave us a completely different answer. 
That was a storm that when we got married, within a year, we're just both of us, because I was in my early 30s and she was in her late 20s, and, and we just knew something like was deep inside of us. It's time to start a family. Like, you don't wait for this one. Okay. So we start moving forward. Nothing happens. And I'm like, I'm feeling this longing. For whatever reason, we feel very broken. Everyone else, I mean, they... they they go on two dates and they're pregnant and, and we're like, we're going on years and it's not happening. We had a lot of wonderful people try to give us advice. And, and the gamut of, have you tried this to, uh, well, just really God is in control or in God's timing. And, and I just, uh, A lot of really good advice from well-meaning people that never struggled with the deep pain of infertility. And, and they would smile and they would pat us on the head and give us really well-meaning encouragement, which is never what we wanted. It actually ended a few relationships with people because we just couldn't handle being around them. We couldn't do it because they were just... What was that? Intrusive. It was kind of intrusive. They felt like they had to keep saying things over and over about God's timing. And, and it's not that that's not true, but it's not true for everyone because I know people that it never happened. So don't tell me what's going to happen because you don't know. God has not given you any kind of prophetic word on that one. And the reality is all we ever wanted was people to just go, man, that sucks. I'm sorry. That is literally all we wanted. Oh, that sucks. Because that acknowledges our pain and our grief. We just wanted people to acknowledge that we were in a storm. And some people couldn't do that. And to this day, if people diminish the pain that my wife and I went through in those 10 years, we still have a very tough time being open and vulnerable in other areas of our life with them. It's like a part of me shuts down because that is still a very tender area in our lives. Even though we now have kids, that season left some very tender scars, we'll say. But this is Paul who is writing this and who's talking to us. He's not some slick-haired TV evangelist on late-night TV who's trying to sell us some kind of miracle cure. He says, I have learned the secret, and it's yours if you just give me 50 bucks. That's not Paul. Paul is a man who did go through storms, and he was beaten many times, often to the point of death. He was whipped and lashed, beaten with rods, stoned once, shipwrecked. I'm like, how did you even live through stoning? That is it's not even, I don't get it. He was lost and floating in the Mediterranean Ocean when he was then found and picked up. I'm just like, you should be dead a dozen times over. And I'm like, you know a little bit of, about being content and experiencing shalom in the middle of a storm. And when he says that, I might just want to listen to this man because in my mind he's earned that respect and the credibility because he has weathered a few storms. In the book of Philippians where he speaks about joy and peace, especially the kind that's beyond understanding, kind of the ones that are in the middle of the storm, he's writing this while he's sitting in a Roman prison and he's not sure if he's going to live or die. And out of that context, he, he starts talking about peace Kind of the peace that, that I, I just, I really need more of. And he's a lonely man sitting in a small cell in the metropolis of Rome. And with every movement, he is clanking the chains that are around his wrist and ankles. And he has nothing to look forward to other than possibly the mouth of a lion or the sword of an executioner. He has absolutely no dreams of what it is that he wants to do with his future or what he's going to do on the weekend, who he's going to be in a relationship. What is he? he has none of those things right now. Out of this kind of context, because he doesn't know anything about the fate of his life, he starts talking about contentment and joy, a, a sense of peace and shalom in the middle of the storm. So maybe, maybe, just maybe, this guy is qualified to speak to me with credibility. Maybe I can learn something that to me seems at times impossible to know, which is the secret of contentment in the middle of the storm. 
So I sit at the feet of Paul, and I just kind of look up at him. And I start to, start to ask and look to see if there's any clues for the secret. And the first thing I notice is this. It's in verse 11. It says, for I have learned. And I go, oh, first of all, that, I like that. You had to learn these things. <laughs> I love that. I love, I love that these things did not come natural to you because I would want to punch you if they did. These things aren't automatic for you either. Good, because they're not automatic for me. The great Apostle Paul, he didn't have a magic wand, no quick fixes. This was something that he had to learn, and, and if he had the ability to do this, maybe I can too, to learn to have this internal peace in the middle of an external storm. And the reason I love it is, is because these things don't come natural to me. He had to learn these things. And if any of you ever had to learn anything at all, then you know that learning sometimes takes time, and it involves a whole lot of failure. Getting it wrong until you get it right. And he had to learn these things just like me, just like you. And the good news is that he did learn them. And the better news is so can I. And so can you. And the first thing about learning the secret of contentment in the middle of the storm is, first of all, you need to cut yourself some slack. You need to give yourself a break in this process of learning how to do this. And be a little bit more peaceful about your lack of peace that maybe you had last week when the storm was hitting your life. Every single one of us had some kind of disturbance at some point this week. Every one of us. That's just greater or smaller. But with the storms in our life, we can feel this disturbance and we identify with the disciples. Because then I go, <laughs> those disciples, they were in the boat and they were frantic and they were panicking at the storm hitting them and they're crying out to Jesus, don't you care about us at all? You're sitting here asleep. And then you feel like a total failure because you didn't know and have this fruit of the Spirit. Well, I didn't have this peace and contentment. I had to go crying out to Jesus asking for help. I'm a total failure. Welcome to the club. That's every one of us and that's not unfamiliar to God about our journey. Because if you want to learn these things, just like everyone else, I know I want to be able to do it different. I thought I would do it different. I thought, even this week when the storm hit, I'm like, I'm preaching on this. This is going to be so great. I'm going to be so good. I'm going to have this one nailed down. Uh, but this week was not a good week. This was a hard week for me and my family. And Man, I was like, I don't want to preach this one because I don't, I mean, I'm, I've failed all week. I have been, I have been, re I'm just a mess and emotional of, God, I don't have your peace. I don't feel connected to you. I don't want to stand up and preach this. And so I've been learning this week to cut myself some slack because I do want to get this right. But the thing is, is that this takes practice and it comes over time because there is no magic wand and there are no quick fixes. There's no special sermon that I have or that anyone could give me that we could download to have the ability to have peace in our hearts in the middle of the storm to have this fruit downloaded into us. You have to learn these things. I have to learn these things just like Paul and that takes experiences. That takes storms. And don't assume that just because Paul says that he had learned these things, that he wasn't still learning these things. There's a way that we need to understand that about ourselves, that we never fully arrive at this. We will spend our whole lives turning from what is wrong to turning to what is right, from darkness into light, where we spend our whole lives doing that as a learner and a follower of the way of Jesus, learning to be a person who finds the secret and peace that is in the middle of a storm where you will learn it and think, I've got it. And then something else comes up that totally takes your feet out and you have to relearn it. It's like, I forgot it. I, for I forgot. How did I forget it? How did I forgive it? I cut myself some slack and I keep learning. I keep leaning into this process because the, it is a process and that is what learning is. And that starts to rise up what starts to rise up for me out of that is, is another question is what are some of the things that Paul learned? 
and that you and I also need to learn? And what are some of the things that taught him the secret of contentment in the middle of the storm? And how did he learn this in the middle of a storm? Well, I think that the primary way that Paul learned to experience peace in the middle of the storm is the same way that most of us do. It's, it's through the storm itself. We can't learn it separate from the storm. And it's not the only way to learn, but it is the primary way that you and I learn because what the storm of life What it does, among other things, is it forces me and it forces us to go to a place that we would not normally go without the storm. I think this week I have fought to hear and talk to God more this week than I have in many weeks previous because when the storm hits, it forces me to go maybe where I hadn't been going or at least not with the passion that I really needed or or with the focus maybe is a better way to say it. The kind of peace that I really like, the kind of peace that I understand best is when it's sunny, when the weather's good and there's no storm. I love that. That's the kind of peace I understand. That, that's not the kind of peace that passes understanding, though. See, when the storm hits, I'm forced by the storm where I have no choice. I am forced by the storm to find another source of peace other than the good weather. The good weather, meaning, meaning positive circumstances, that was the source of my peace until the storm hit. Are you following me on this one? Good. Paul was beaten so many times, he couldn't even keep count of how many times he had been beaten. Many times he was beaten almost to the point of death. So Paul, how did you experience this kind of inner peace when you're about to die several times? How? how, how, how? Tell me that one, Paul. I would love to know how you did that. I think somewhere on his journey, on the, uh, that journey was on in his own heart, he had, to, he had to let go of his own life. He had to let go of what he thought he had to have to have peace. And that might have even meant his life. The only way to come to life when you're literally facing death is letting go. All great spirituality is about letting go. Letting go of what you think that you have to have Enjoying what you do have, whether it's your house and your car, your family, you know, your peace. But the day that you need or have to have whatever it is that you have to have. Storms don't automatically teach us peace because sometimes when the storm comes, rather than letting go of the things that we need to let go of to be able to find God in the middle of the storm, sometimes what we do is we want to hold tighter. <laughs> I'm going to double down on this one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to will build a bigger vault, a bigger wall. I'm going to use thicker stones. I am going gonna, gonna to fight this one. And sometimes I find that when I'm in the middle of a storm, what I bump up against is my need for control. Sometimes I think maybe if I shoulder this one and push it hard enough, maybe I could actually change the weather. And if I could control the weather, I would. Sometimes we will even get, some of us will get into the spiritual battle with it. In the name of Jesus, I command the weather to stop. And, and we try to use God. I'm going to use God to control my circumstances. Maybe, maybe I can command God to fix it. But that's not what Paul is talking about. That's not the kind of peace that Paul was experiencing, he he was experiencing peace even though the circumstances in no way had changed, even though the weather had not changed in his life at all. And I go, something here feels really big. This feels beyond my understanding. He was beaten three times just with rods. And, And is the storm coming? That better be the kids. (laughs) I start thinking about Paul getting beaten with rods. And what occurs to me is maybe halfway through the second beating with these sticks and bars that he began to think while he's laying on a stump, maybe he's thinking because... You know, I'm Paul. Oof, oof, and he's taking these beatings. If I'm ever going to have any joy in my life, (laughs) 
If I'm ever going to have any peace at all, even a whiff of it from time to time, uh, it's going to have to come from a different source than how these guys are beating me right now. It's going to have to come from a different place than what these guys think of me or how my body is failing right now and how it feels. Even if I live or die in the next five minutes, if I'm going to ever have any peace I better quickly have a different source of joy. Because if I don't find a different source of peace, then I will never have peace. And my only hope is to find my living God as my source. And none of us typically cry out for that voluntarily. Typically, it's in the storm that drives me there and teaches us that. I remember a time when life was dark, maybe darker than the last week for me. I was full of doubt about myself, about direction that I was trying to go in life, not knowing what I was supposed to do. Life just felt like it had crashed in on me. Some of it was my own doing. Some of it was just storm of life, and I was empty, and I started to cry out to God. Like, how am I supposed to have any joy or peace in the middle of these circumstances that are swirling around me? I was, felt like I was in a tornado. God, how am I going to experience any joy or peace in my heart? How do I experience the fruit? How do I do this when I'm really just full of fear, and I have no idea what I'm doing or how to make a decision right now. And I heard kind of an answer. Um, Here's how you do it, Kenny. You're going to have to find a different source, an entirely different source of peace than what you think you need to have, a different source of peace other than if your marriage succeeds or, or if you have a different job or if your family recovers or you know, your family members from this uh, abuse that they were dealing with or the sickness that was happening to another family member, you, you, need to build, you need to be able to find a different source of peace because there may not actually be a cure for your dad on this one because if, if you have to have any of these things fixed for you to have peace, then Kenny, you need to know right now you've got a problem. And, I, and I, knew this, I knew this, I just didn't want that to be the answer. I, think I knew it, but I, I, didn't really, I didn't learn it until I was in the storm. Because when I let go of the things I thought I had to have for my joy and my peace, then I felt a deep sense of peace in God. I felt like I could take a deep breath for the first time in, in what felt like a couple years. And it came from a confidence in God, not that my family would be healed, because my father ultimately died of what he had, and I didn't get any of the jobs that I thought I needed to have, that I wanted, and, and I had to go through several years of counseling and work, literal more breaking to help my marriage and then for me to be a, a father. But learning to say, God, I trust in you. I put my confidence in you, even if nothing changes in my life, and I'm going to be okay. And it taught me a different level of trust. I learned that. And I've had to relearn that over and over and over again. I was learning, just like you do, and that is how the secret of peace comes in the middle of the storm. And what taught it to me was the storm of life. And a crucial, a crucial piece was also Paul learned how to pray in the middle of this. And I love that Paul had to learn how to pray, that he, he needed to learn how to pray, that it didn't even come natural for him. It wasn't automatic. And if you and I need to learn to continue to pray too, there's good news is that we can continue to learn how to pray. And I'm not talking about praying for your meal, though that is wonderful. I'm talking about a lifestyle of interacting with and talking to and connecting with God. That as you learn to do it, you will get better and better at it. And you come to a place where you can start to do it all day, whether you're driving in your car, whether you're in the shower, at work. Sometimes you could even do it when you're at church, which is just amazing. I love that. Paul learned to pray. And in his praying, he learned that by practicing the presence meaning to recognize the presence of God, to be with God, which is what he was praying and what he's learning, 
just to be with God. One of the ways I try to practice the presence of God is I journal. Uh, a lot of my journaling is just me talking to God. It's not just writing down facts and information. I'm conscious as a, uh, I'm writing about talking to God and trying to listen even. Maybe sometimes I, I just sit and I don't write. Sometimes in prayer I, get, I can get so busy wanting to talk to God. I think prayer is me talking as opposed to maybe shutting up and me listening. And then over time, if you do that, because Paul did that, he came to know, not just in his head, but through experience, he came to know that God was with him in the middle of the storm. And the fact that God was with him in the middle of the storm, and, and he knew that, that is what brought him peace, a kind of peace that was beyond understanding. Because if I need the kind of peace where there's no storm in my life for me to be able to be calm in my heart and, and to have that, that's going to be a rare thing. But Paul is talking about a different kind of peace. He talks about this in the, in the same chapter in, in Philippians. He says, the Lord is near. That is such a great way to say that. I love that right there. Just the Lord is near. And when I, when I hear Paul say this, I want to ask him a question. Okay, how do you know that? Paul, how do you know that the Lord is near? I think it came from a place where Paul just knew that out of experience, he I think he knew it by learning it. Not some test he took that someone's saying, well, the right answer is the Lord is always near, but, but it was by continually this process of talking to God and praying right in the middle of the storms. And the more he did that, the more he learned to go to God in prayer right in the middle of the storms, then the more he experienced and understood, wow, the Lord is near. Sometimes... I don't sense or feel the presence of God. But the more I learn to go to God in the middle of the storm when I am most afraid, when I am most in doubt of him and his care for me, when I go to God in the middle of that, the more I have come to know that God is near, that he is in the boat with me, and that brings me peace. And in no way has that resolved my last week. But we're working at it, and we're getting there. And with that kind of credibility, I want to listen to the rest of the advice that he gives. He says, Kenny, verse 6, don't be anxious about anything. Okay, I got that one down. It's, it's, it's always something that I get anxious about. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, which means invite God into your <laughs> storm, right in the middle of your fear, right in the middle of your panic, right in the middle of your worry. So the question I have for you guys is what is the wave that is hitting you in your life? Right now, this last week, some of you, I, 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 I think you might think you're going to get washed right off the boat. And, and if that's you, you can just stop listening to me right now and talk to God. You don't need me. Right into the fact that you feel like you're losing your grip. And, and don't pretend that you're doing better than you are. Don't do that, at least not for me. And if you're a person who panics, don't pretend you're not panicking if you are. But now in the middle of the fear and in the middle of the panic, in the middle of the feeling like you don't do very well and you're failing this whole thing, in the middle of that, you need to also know that the Lord is near. He's in the boat. He's with you. He might be sleepy, but uh, we'll talk about that one another time. Uh, but he is in the boat with you. And as we dial into that, in the middle of your pain and your dread, start to tell God exactly what it is that you want. Let your requests be known. And, and don't put on some religious voice, but just tell the truth and be yourself. Pour it out, tell the truth, be yourself. That is how we should always come to God. Pour it out, tell the truth, be yourself. The way to really learn how to pray is to learn to be yourself first of all. Be who you are. Don't be who you think you're supposed to be. Don't be who you wish you were. Come exactly the way you are to God. And the reason you can come the way you are is because the Lord is near. He is in the boat with you. And, and sometimes, sometimes the storm is going to be calmed. 
You know it. It's talked about in the Bible. And, and I'm sure for some of you it's actually happened in your life. And when it is, when I have cried out to God in the middle of the storm, when it is calmed, and, and then this peace comes, I start to wonder, what was it that I was actually so worried about? Thank you. Thank you, God. I should have known. I should have known you were going to calm the storm. I should have trusted you. Oh, me of little faith. And then we have peace. And, and it, is a, it, is a, it is a peace that is born of God. It's the real thing. And it's within my understanding. I have peace because God calmed the storm. I get that peace, but sometimes the storm is not calmed, and Paul would one day be beheaded, and that day his, his boat sank because that storm was not calmed for him. One day Stephen, full of obedience of God under the anointing of the Spirit of God, he's preaching one of the best sermons he'd ever preached in his life, he, and these people who were so annoyed with him and frustrated and angry at the things that he was saying, they stoned him to death. And his boat went down that day. Peter one day was going to be crucified upside down. So notice the promise carefully that Paul makes about peace in the middle of the storm. He doesn't say that the power of God is going to calm the storm. That is not the promise that is given. He says the peace of God is going to guard your heart. That is the promise here. That does not mean that, it doesn't, that the storm isn't ever going to be calmed, that God won't calm it sometimes, but when we're bringing our requests to God in the middle of the storm, don't be afraid to request. You know, that, that would be the thing. You can request God to calm the storm. It's okay, because sometimes he will do that. He just doesn't always do that. But if you have to have the storm calmed for peace, then you will never learn what it is that Paul learned. So how did Paul know that the peace of God would guard your heart in the middle of a storm? Because he practiced these things. He learned these things over time, just like you learn them, just like I learned them, by taking his fear and his anxiety and bringing them to God. And the more he did that, the more he came to know that what he, he didn't think was true when the storm began to brew is that the Lord is near. The Lord is very near. And the more that he was honest with God in the middle of the storm, the more he learned that the Lord is near and that he's in the boat with me. And then I have nothing to fear, even if even if the boat goes down. So here's my request. Lord, as the wind and the waves are bumping up against the sides of my life, you're asking me to bring my requests to you. So here's my request, God. Number one, calm the storm. It's okay to ask that. God, the storm that's out here, can you please calm that? So we pray, Holy Spirit, come with your healing for that disease, heal the storm of my own body or my friend's body or, or the circumstance. Holy Spirit, come and heal. Bring my husband back or provide the money that we don't have for our family. Holy Spirit, come and calm the storm, we pray. But the second request, more than calming the storm around me, God, calm the storm that's inside of me. Calm the storm that is right here. I've been praying this all week. Because I've had storms that have been trying to shake me. Paul learned the secret because he practiced it. He learned it and so can we. And you can do this anywhere. Whether you're in the shower, in your car, whether you, wherever you are, you just kind of dial into God. And sometimes it's not even with words that we cry this out. It's just that I recognize God you just become aware of the presence of God and you can even do it in church. So just take a second and, and really here's my request. I want you to try this. This is Sometimes it helps to just actually put it in practice today and then we take it out into the world. Uh, but try this. Just close your eyes. Relax your body if it helps. This is a, it's kind of a discipline area. And in the quiet, ask God to help you be aware of his presence. To become aware of something that we may not always be aware of, that he is near. Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. The Lord is near, closer than your breath. 
He is in the boat with you. Identify that wave that is hitting you. Maybe you've got them coming from different directions. Identify several of them if you need to. And now with, with no fancy words, no editing of the things, well, that doesn't seem, I gotta say this, or pray it the right way. Don't, don't do that. Don't edit yourself. Just let your request be made known to God. What is it you need? What is it that you want? Just tell God. It's okay to do this because the Lord is near. I'm